Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Steve Wu. We're going to talk today about the evolution of DRAM. Steve, when you think about DRAM, it's become a critical part of almost every design that's being done out there in hardware. Yeah, it's, a, it's really amazing that for a technology that was developed more than 50 years ago, uh, that the technology itself has fundamentally stayed the same, uh, yet you know, been evolved in a way that it's, it's found a way to become so critical in so many of our computing devices. So really it's been the building block, but that building block is now in a much more complex structure, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically the same, but uh, with our manufacturing improvements that have happened over the decades, we're now able to go much faster and have much more capacity in our memory devices. Let's take a closer look. Sure. Steve, what are we looking at? Yeah, so this is the fundamental architecture of DRAM. So back in the 1960s, this architecture was first developed and patented. And it's a, it's a really brilliant architecture. Basically, each bit of information is stored in a capacitor here. Um, and there's access to that capacitor is done through a transistor, which is shown right here. This is what we call the 1T, 1C bit cell. Now, the overall access is managed by some things called word line drivers and, and bit lines and sense amps that actually take the charge that are on these cells, amplify them and store them in the sense amps, and then drive them back out to the host. What's really amazing about this is that this fundamental architecture is still in use today. And what we've done as a semiconductor industry is we've done the things we've always been able to do, which is come up with better manufacturing improvements. And so we can, put, uh, we can shrink and put so many more of these on a device. We've gone from the original days of having kilobits stored in a DRAM uh, through megabits to today where we have gigabits stored in each DRAM. We pretty much run out of runway for shrinking, right? Well, not really. Um, you know, the industry has is, is got a lot of clever people. And so although it's maybe not as simple to shrink as it used to be in the past, there's a lot of really interesting innovations that people are looking at. And, you know, maybe it's become a little bit harder and maybe it's slowing just a little bit. Uh, but there are some new innovations coming along the way where people are looking at this kind of structure and starting to think about, well, maybe like in other technologies, instead of putting everything on a plane, maybe we can start to grow them in, in the third dimension and make three-dimensional DRAM. Well, that's already happening with HBM, right? Well, sure. In HBM, uh, we have multiple layers of, of DRAM devices, and then we stack those layers together. Uh, the next kind of step that the industry is looking at is within an individual layer, can I actually build uh, on a single piece of silicon layers of bit cells? So you'll get kind of a doubling effect where each layer will now have three dimensions of bit cells, and I can take multiple layers and stack them together. And that'll allow us to continue to scale the technology. This is the 3D DRAM? Yep, yeah, this is 3D DRAM. So it's on the horizon uh, and the memory industry is, uh, is working towards that. Going back maybe uh, five, seven years ago, everybody thought, oh, there's never going to be a DDR5. It's done. What's changed? Well, you know, there's a, a lot of smart people in the world. And so uh, like we've always done in the industry, you take a look at what the difficult problems are and you, you just attack them. And one by one, you kind of slay the dragons as they come. And the industry uh, you know, found ways to uh, improve manufacturing technology, improve packaging, uh, and also to improve signaling uh, in ways that have been able to allow the technology to continue to scale. And you know, now that DDR5 is out, I mean, you know, people are looking to see, well, what's the next thing? Well, you've got something of a trade-off here because it's not just about what's going, how many cells you can fit in there, it's also about how fast you can get the data to and from and through, right? That's right. So um, there's really a part of the DRAM, the core, where these bits are stored. And those bits, you have to get access to them at a rate that's fast enough to kind of feed the movement of the data back and forth between the host and the DRAM. The other part of it is this challenge you've mentioned, which is, um, you know, how can I continue to move more data more quickly from the DRAM to the host? And, uh, you know, what we see is um, the way that we solve this problem is different in different markets. And that's partly why we have different kinds of DRAMs today. What's the difference between each yeah. one? Well, let me show you how they've evolved. So here what we're seeing is a typical DRAM. You know, there's two parts of the DRAM. There's this thing called the interface and this thing called the core. The core is where the bits are stored. And what's really interesting is that if you look at these different kinds of DRAM, uh, the cores are pretty much the same across all kinds. So DDR, LPDDR, 
GDDR and HPM. Those cores largely look the same. There are minor differences in maybe how many bits they're stored in the core, how many banks, and how many uh, channels you have. But, but by and large, the, the 1T, 1C bit cell is the same across all technologies. Where these DRAMs really differ is in these interfaces and how they're packaged. So the interfaces are specifically designed to work with the packaging and particular way the DRAMs are going to be used in each market. So what changes when you go from the typical DIMMs to GDDR and LPDDR? Yeah, so uh, in the case of uh, computing and main memory, so things like servers and PCs, we take our DRAMs and we have many of DRAMs packaged together on one DIMM module, so memory module with just a lot of DRAMs on them. Each of those DRAMs has kind of a narrow interface, a few pins, and you gang them together to get a lot of capacity and a lot of bandwidth. And the design there is um, the, the, the DRAM interfaces are designed so that you can put them on these little DIMM modules and that you can drive from those DIMM modules across the connector back to the host. But when you talk about something like GDDR or LPDDR, there's really no connector, anything like that. Um, the channels are much shorter, so we typically will solder those devices directly down to um, a, a board or something like that that the, that the processor is also connected to. Uh, in some cases, they're, uh, they're connected directly to each other you know, in this way. And so the channels tend to be very short, the interfaces tend to be wider, and what really is different about it is, in the case of DDR, the distances we're driving between the, the processor and the memories is much, much longer than the distances that we drive between, say, a GDDR device and a, a, and a, a processor there. Might only be you know, an inch or two, but in the case of, uh, you're talking about main memory with DIMMs, it, uh, it's many inches. That allows you to move through much larger uh, amounts of data very quickly, right? And also at low power. That's correct, yeah. So these interfaces are really designed for a, a range of distances. That's one of the big differentiators in the different kinds of memory. And so um, you can generally go faster when the connections are shorter, and you can generally be more power efficient as well. And so uh, in the case of, say, mobile devices, where uh, energy is and power are so important because you're on a battery, uh, you like to have very short connections, and you're really trying to optimize for a very specific distance, so you can really optimize those circuits to be as power efficient as possible. One of the big challenges here is that as we start getting into more advanced nodes, as we get into these higher density computing, like AI, for example, you now have a lot of data, you have a lot of heat that's coming out of the, the components around that. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's really market specific. So uh, if you take a look at AI, like you mentioned, you have a lot of components that are in close proximity to each other. In the past, it's been the case that um, you know, we flowed air uh, and had big heat sinks over the processors and, uh, and, and also over the memory. Well, these days, uh, you know, the demand for performance is so high that we actually need more advanced cooling. And what we're seeing now is in the case of AI, liquid is being used. So you have big heat sinks and you're flowing liquid onto those heat sinks to help wick away uh, the excess heat. And you have to keep that far enough away from the DRAM as well in order to make it work, right? Well, yeah, in fact, the DRAM is, is actually part of this cooling solution as well. So as the liquid flows over uh, the heat sink, that heat sink actually touches both the processor and the memories. And it's all, uh, it's all kind of required because the performance of the DRAM is so sensitive to the actual heat and temperature. And part of this is also a result of the fact that you can't scale SRAM anymore, right? That's right, yeah. What we're seeing in the industry is, um, you know, in the past, uh, SRAM has actually been able to scale fairly well, but yeah, as you mentioned, uh, one of the interesting challenges that the DRAM industry is responding to is that the amount of SRAM, or you know, kind of cache memory that you typically see in processors and GPUs, that's not scaling, which is putting pressure on the systems because the data sets are growing. So now if you've got large amounts of data and you can't really grow the amount of cache or SRAM that you would like per core, then the next level in the memory hierarchy has to respond, both with more capacity and more bandwidth. And also more speed, right? I mean, that's what this comes down to. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the couple of ways you can get more bandwidth, you can have more pins or you can run those pins faster. And in these space-constrained systems, it's a lot harder to get more pins. And so, uh, you know, if you can get more pins, you're still being pressured to increase the rate at which you can signal over those pins. And that's really one of the biggest challenges that the industry is facing today. As you run more data through this, 
What happens to the DRAM itself? I mean, these things are being used a lot differently than they were in the past. Yeah, there's, there's some really big challenges out there. We talked about power and thermals. One thing that we haven't talked about is that it becomes more difficult to have error-free operation. So these days, um, you know, the number of bits that we're putting onto a DRAM die means each of those capacitors, which is storing charge, they're getting smaller. And so it becomes, a, they become more error prone. So today, the, the different DRAM types, they all have on-die error correction, meaning they can actually tolerate if um, an individual bit cell's data uh, goes bad. And so they can actually correct the data on-die and then send the data back to the host. And ECC in the past was something that was sort of, oh, here's an extra uh, sense of security that you have with your DRAM, right? Yeah, that's right. In fact, what we're seeing is a proliferation in the use of ECC. So in the past, um, the DRAMs didn't have on-die error correction. Instead, what you did in the case of, say, uh, main memory DIMMs is you used extra devices on the DIMM module to store uh, some additional data, some codes that could be used to correct the actual data that's being transmitted back and forth. You still have that today, but in addition to that, we actually have on-die error correction as well. So you, now you can see there's this layering of uh, different methods for improving reliability. And reliability is really uh, becoming a more important part of, of the equation across all markets. And DRAM is now becoming an absolutely critical piece of this whole thing, whereas in the past it was sort of, Oh, what are we going to store the data and how far do we want to go, right? Yeah, that's right. In fact, um, what one of the big things that's changed is, especially in cases like AI, when you're talking about these are really large, large language models and things like that, the amount of time it takes to train them is weeks. And so you can imagine if you've got um, you know thousands of GPUs working together to train the largest models, um, if you do have errors, um, it can be, you know, it can cause you to have to uh, restart your system. And so many of these techniques that have been developed for the super, in the supercomputing world, like checkpointing and then pulling back from the checkpoints and restarting your system on a catastrophic failure, those are in use today. And, you know, the ability to minimize those kinds of things is based on, you know, the, uh, the continued use and, and, you know, being able to use things like on-die ECC and system-level ECC, like I mentioned. How about security? I mean, think about most of, when I think about security with DRAM, I tend to think of roll hammer. Is, oh, there, is there more to it now though? Because is it becoming a much more critical element in how the computing is done? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting that you mentioned row hammer. There's uh, there's new kinds of effects like row hammer and row press where um, because these devices are getting closer and closer together because we're shrinking them, we're putting more of them onto a chip you start to have these neighbor disturb effects. So when you operate a device and, and you know, some, some of the bit cells, they can actually influence what happens in neighboring bit cells. In fact, if you access a set of cells many, many times repeatedly, you can actually cause charge in neighboring cells, which weren't even accessed. You can cause the charge to move and that could cause you to lose data. And so uh, these kinds of uh, newer effects like row hammer and there's a related uh, kind of phenomenon called row press, uh, those are things that uh, both the device has to take into account and be able to identify and, and warn the system about. Uh, and the controllers and the rest of the system have to figure out you know, how to mitigate these kinds of things once the DRAM tells, it, uh, tells them that there's one of these kinds of things going on. So the basic structure doesn't change, but how it's put together does change, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, in some sense, um, you know, the architecture and the, the bit cells you know, are the same. It's really, um, what are we going to do to mitigate some of these other effects? And so uh, it turns out, in the case of Rowhammer, um, the individual rows of bits have even more bits. And those bits, um, they keep account of the number of times that row has been accessed. Uh, and so when that count gets to be a certain level or a certain threshold, then the controller is, is notified that, hey, you know, you're, you're running the risk of having a, a, you know, losing data due to row hammer. And so it's, uh, you know, the industry is you know, really continuing to evolve the architecture, but figure out ways to mitigate, uh, you know, some of these new kinds of phenomena, new kinds of reliability concerns. How much more life is there in DRAM? How many more revs are we going to get out of this? Well, you know, the, the industry is very clever. There's a lot of really smart people. And so uh, I think for the foreseeable future, I think DRAM does have life in it. You know, it's, it's hard for me to predict exactly how many years, but I don't see anything that's gonna stop it for the next five to 10 years. And, um, you know, thinking beyond that is kind of hard, but, um, you know, I, I really think DRAM's got 
really a minimum of, t of 10 years or more left into it. <clears throat> and this is more of a process challenge going forward too, right? Yeah, that's right. I, I think, you know, with a basic architecture, the issue is about scaling it and making it smaller. It's a very dense, very area efficient kind of architecture. And so, um, you know, like we've always done in the semiconductor industry, in continuing to be able to shrink and to reduce the cost and to be able to pack more bits onto a chip, that's really the direction. And, you know, like I mentioned, there's a lot of life left in the, in the DRAM architectures and, um, you know, a lot of life left in the manufacturing processes. So, again, for the foreseeable future, really don't see anything replacing DRAM. Steve Wu, thanks for a great explanation. Thanks very much, Ed.